Check, check. Okay. So I think we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're standing between you and your afternoon cocktail, so we'll try to make this lively and uh, engaging. Uh, my name is Greg Holzerter. I'm the CMO of Big Switch Networks, and I'm joined by a great panel here of uh, both operators uh, as well as service providers. We're going to talk about uh, Neutron and uh, experience working with Neutron in the real world. I know that that's a, a very hot topic and uh, one where people are exploring how do you get scalability, how do you work through some of the, the challenges and opportunities of, of Neutron. And uh, without further ado, we're going to kind of go ahead and jump right in and introduce the panel. Um, so, uh, Christian Sarenson is the uh, uh, CEO of Clean Safe Cloud. He'll talk a little bit more about what they do. Um, Dallas Thornton is a deputy CEO of Clemson University. Uh, Dimitar Ivanov is, is in the office of the CTO uh, from TELUS. And we're joined by Wang Wei, who's a CDN, uh, SDN architect from United Stack, based in China. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and have the panel introduce themselves and a little bit about their environments uh, to kick things off. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Christian Sarasin. I spent uh, something like 19 years working as a software developer in the um, uh, finance industry for my sins. Um, wrote things and, and architected things like uh, low latency trading systems, for example. Um, for tier one investment banks. Uh, last year, or perhaps about 18 months ago, um, I had to relocate from, from London, UK, where I was based, to back to Switzerland, which is my home country. Um, and the question was, well, what next? Um, and it turns out that a certain Mr. Snowden has actually um, gifted Switzerland with a, with a great new uh, USP, as it were, um, which, is, which is, you know, the fact that Switzerland uh, despite being in the middle of Europe, is um, outside of NSA and GCHQ and whatever else jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, for people who care about privacy, etc., it's quite an interesting place to, to put your data. Um, and this is how CleanSafe Cloud was born. Hi, I'm uh, Dallas Thornton. I'm a deputy CIO at uh, Clemson University. I've been there about two years, uh, and in that time, uh, one of the big things we've been working on is uh, sort of designing our new pod and hosting infrastructure. Um, we do sort of the typical university mission work, but we also support a lot of research users, uh, as well as uh, support hosting for a lot of government agencies in the state. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work with that. Um, our big use case um, that we sort of started us off here, aside from the pod uh, design, uh, was uh, virtual desktop um, usage. So uh, we, we wanted to build something that would allow us to, uh, you know, especially with the network side of things um, and supporting VDI, uh, which in a university environment is very, uh, uh, very spiky in, 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 in terms of usage. So um, that led us to, uh, to working with these guys on uh, uh, developing that out and building it on top of OpenStack. And, uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dimitri Ivanov. I'm, uh, I work for TELUS. Uh, TELUS is a telecommunications provider in uh, Canada. Uh, we are um, uh, headquartered in uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. Uh, we have about um, uh, 8 million wireless subscribers, uh, about a couple of million um, uh, high-speed uh, internet subscribers, uh, about a million uh, TV subscribers. So that gives you an idea about the uh, the size of the company. Um, I work for the office of the of the CTO. I'm a I'm a cloud architect. Uh, for the last uh, uh, two years, I've been uh, you know, focused on developing uh, cloud architecture for a you know private cloud environment to use in our uh, you know for the internal business units uh, at Telus. Um, you know the primary one of the primary drivers. There are many of them, but uh, you know kind of the more sizable one, I guess, is uh, for our TV service. Uh, kind of we're looking at a um, you know, a pretty sizable cloud. I, I can't even, you know, uh, uh, kind of disclose the size uh, of it and all that. But uh, uh, it is a pretty sizable environment that uh, we uh, we are building. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Wang Wei from United Stack. I'm the Austin architect. Uh, we provide uh, a public OpenStack cloud and a private OpenStack cloud in China. And uh, uh, we have about uh, nearly 100 customers, which we provide the professional OpenStack service. And uh, the most, uh, the biggest uh, customer 
run about 500 hypervisors in purely OpenStack. And as for me, I have made contribution to Neutron for two years. And uh, uh, through these years, I, we have seen the Neutron has grown fast, but with some problems. I will share this experience and uh, the problems or the uh, tricks to, to you. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, picking up from that, why don't we go through the experience of you know starting off working with uh, OpenStack and, and Neutron um, and with you, Christian. What was the, uh, the the reason that you kind of looked at OpenStack? What were the issues and problems that you were trying to resolve? We we had great luxury in as much as you know we we basically built everything from scratch, uh, which I realize is certainly not you know everybody's uh, luck, uh, but it was ours. Um, so, so we were able, basically, starting out in sort of late 2014, so Ice House time frame, um, to um, select an, an architecture and an infrastructure which we were hoping to be as much uh, open source as possible, no vendor lock-in, uh, and flexibility being uh, an absolute top goal that we had because you know we were just starting out. We we, we were talking to some customers, but. Uh, by and large, it was very hard to anticipate at the time what we were going to have to deliver for those customers, say, even six months down the line. Um, so really an architecture that's based on, 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 ev on everything software defined, and that obviously includes um, software defined networking, um, was extremely appealing for us. And that's, that's how we kind of came to uh, OpenStack and, and hence Neutron. I mean, in, in the Ice House, uh, which was our first proof of concept time frame, Neutron was already pretty well established and it was pretty clear that, you know, that was going to be the, the only game in town a few, a few months down the line. That's great. Dallas, you want to talk a little, a little bit about the background in your environment? Sure. So, uh, you know, I mentioned our VDI use case, and that's really kind of what, what initially drove us. Um, our issue was a lot, had a lot to do with licensing and, uh, you know, having 20,000 uh, students out there and another, uh, you know, 6,000 uh, faculty staff. Um, you know, the, the, the use cases for VDI and, and the cost on a per user basis for a lot of the VDI solutions that were out there were, were prohibitive. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, how, how do we do this in an open way um, and build out, um, you know, a VDI environment that allows us to deal with a lot of the custom software that's, that's out there in academia um, that, you know, in a way that we could manage and scale out sort of as needed. Um, and so OpenStack really allowed us to do that. That's great. So you had a, a VMware environment and you were looking at moving into OpenStack then? Correct. So a lot of our legacy hosting environment um, was and still is uh, VMware. Um, and uh, so, so this was sort of, you know, how do we actually roll out a new service in VDI um, on a new platform and uh, using OpenStack for that. Fantastic. And, and Dimitar, what, um, what do you, in terms of the background for TELUS, what was the, uh, the, the reason for kind of looking at OpenStack and, and the background there? Yeah, uh, much of the same reasons uh, the guys already uh, mentioned, but, uh, you know, with uh, us being a service provider, um, uh, you know, uh, I presume most of the, uh, you know, if, if you know that uh, um, the service provider have been kind of adopting uh, for the last few years uh, uh, OpenStack uh, for, um, you know, for NAV and SDN. So as being a service provider, we're not um, kind of, we're not different. We kind of, we, we, we follow that same, uh, same trend. Uh, so selecting, uh, you know, OpenStack for us was kind of the, um, you know, pretty much, a, you know, I would say a, a kind of no-brainer uh, from that point of view because we would obviously it would be, uh, you know, we don't want to develop uh, uh, two different uh, platforms for, uh, you know, NAV or cloud. So, um, and, uh, but th that's not the only thing though. Um, the, um, uh, you know what what was just mentioned about you know being uh, as much as um, you know open source um, and um, uh, kind of avoid any uh, or as much as possible um, you know vendor lock-ins uh, from the perspective of um, the underlying infrastructure but also from the you know the for the actual cloud control layer um, and that was the uh, you know that is the real driver which is the you know the driver for uh, and the reason why the, the service providers are adopting OpenStack in, in, in the first place. Um, in, you know, if you want to develop, um, um, you know, software, uh, 
uh, software define everything, um, uh, the, you know, OpenStack is uh, really um, is pretty much the only uh, the only game in town. Um, the, you know, because the um, you know uh, Amazon or Microsoft or all the public providers that you know have invested in proprietary solutions, um, you know, they're not they're not productized, right? So, um, you know, it is it is great that we you know we we have OpenStack and you know uh, should be grateful for it. So. That's great. So, uh, you know, when you have a unique perspective uh, being in China and um, being with an organization that really is at the forefront of delivering OpenStack solutions, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, talking through the evolution of Neutron and, and particularly the adoption in, in China and some of the, the challenges and opportunities? Mm, okay, as we know that uh, networking OpenStack from the Nova network, it's pretty stable, but it's too uh, too small and the feature is too 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 short and uh, then community pushed the neutron the neutron project from about uh, ice house or the Juno and uh, from the the neutron is pretty well complex everybody will say that it's uh, the the fr reference uh, um, implementation is from the is OVS based it have many complex uh, components and uh, many virtual network, network devices. And then the, the community has uh, put the Neutron to a framework or a platform. And uh, there are many new projects around the OpenStack, like uh, Dragonflow, like uh, OVN, and Open Daylight. And now the community seems more and more excessive and uh, fruitful. And, uh, uh, you can use Neutron as a framework and a platform, not use it as a, it's as a uh, STM solution. It's a, a very exciting trend, and we think it will make the STM in OpenStack more and more healthy. That's great. And going back to you, Dimitar, uh, you say in terms of your experience uh, with OpenStack and, and with Neutron in particular in your deployment, um, you know, what were some of the, the key kind of findings that you discovered along your journey in terms of POC? It's something that you uh, didn't expect to find. Um, you know, there wasn't so much that we, you know, we didn't expect to find. Uh, there weren't, you know, any, any big surprises. The, um, you know, the, the challenges of, uh, you know, in terms of deployment, uh, de deploying, um, you know, uh, networking solutions for, uh, um, you know, virtualized networking in, in general, um, you know, specifically with, with Neutron, they're not, uh, they kind of, they're, they're quite well documented. So, uh, you know, we, we try to, um, you know, avoid those surprises from, um, you know, just with, uh, just with research and, and um, you know, making sure that we, we learn from um, other people's, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, challenges. Uh, so we, um, uh, uh, from from that perspective, I, I I can't really think of anything that we um, kind of that happened that we didn't uh, and didn't we didn't anticipate. Uh, but uh, it it was a um, uh, really um, uh, kind of uh, uh, in a in a in a good way to kind of find out that we um, that there are solutions out there that can help with. Uh, uh, with, um, uh, you know, overcoming these challenges, uh, specifically, um, you know, with, um, that, that, that we, um, you know, if you're building virtualizing, virtualized solutions, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that you have to do is, uh, you obviously have to have a network that you run on, right? Um, and um, managing of that network is something that you have to, uh, you have to do regardless of what solution you have in place. And, and having a solution that is, um, uh, that is manageable, that it, it helps, you to, uh, helps you to scale, and at the same time, uh, it reduces the, uh, you know, reduces the complexity of, the, uh, of, of, of your deployment, and the ongoing management is, is extremely important. Uh, so that's the kind of the one message that I would, um, you know, um, kind of that I found for for ourselves that, uh, uh, you know, there, there are many solutions that uh, that will work, um, but um, you know, some of them require uh, just more, um, you know, more involvement, and some of them are, you know, less, uh, 
uh, kind of more manageable, and uh, from that perspective, uh, you know, they're easier to they easier to deploy. Got it. Great. So, so Dallas, in terms of your experience when you were looking at deploying, uh, you know, using Neutron and OpenStack, um, did you come up with, uh, did you come against scaling problems, or are there ways that you kind of got around those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think again, our big use case in VDI, we're, we're looking at, you know, how do we get away from all the encapsulation problems that we had, you know, initially, uh, d d you know, looking at this using traditional um, sort of fabrics, and uh, so, so, you know. Uh, Rolling, rolling that out along with um, you know the big switches and SDN um, paradigm, it, it really allowed us to overcome some of those issues. I mean, honestly, I think that the biggest thing uh, we learned and are still learning is kind of the human factor side of it, and um, you know the, the, the fact that you know we had a, net, a network team that always did things, and there was tickets that went to you know uh, one person that went to another, and, and it's really you know for us has been all about how, how do we automate the whole process and and um, really get a lot of the bottlenecks out out, out of the system. Um, and you know, uh, you know that that's a not not as not as much of a technical problem as it is a as a, as, it, as it is a process problem, and um, it's something that uh, you know I think we, we're, we're making progress on, and uh, um, people are learning new skill sets. And uh, again, I think it's a, it's a human uh, a human learning thing. You know, that was interesting in the in the keynote on uh, Monday. There was a conversation about you know 10% technology, 90% sort of organization. Could you comment a little bit more about you know before and after in terms of your org? Uh, how did how did that change? What did it look like before and, and now? Sure, and and we're 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 definitely still evolving, but um, you know we, we've we've gone from a you know a process where you know a, you know. IP assignment was manual, and you know, DNS assignment was manual, and, and uh, it took three different groups to do that. To you know, now we've got uh, people who can automate that. Um, you know, we were big salt users. I mean, we we, we call everything, and uh, and basically the whole provisioning process can now be automated. So um, for us, that it's a big par paradigm change. It, it's um, you know changing people's world a bit, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it, pu it puts us in a lot better uh, a lot better state. That's great. And, and Christian, could you maybe uh, build on uh, you know, some of the existing challenges and then you know, what are you working on as your, your, next, uh, your next milestone, your next uh, goal? Sure. Um, well, in terms of challenges, what we found out is that, I mean, I, and I guess it doesn't come as a surprise, right? You're, uh, at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. In this instance, you don't pay much, therefore, you shouldn't expect too much. Um, which is, is actually, you know, in essence, you get an awful, and, and you know, I think, I think we're all here extremely thankful uh, to all the people and all the corporations that put all of this extremely hard work into making this stuff work, you know, so well, out of the box. Uh, in, our, in our case, I, I had, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I was, as I was a software developer. I had very little experience of what I call the dark side of IT at the time, um, which, which is the infrastructure stuff, right? Um, and, and, you know, with, with close to zero experience in networking, etc. well, lo and behold, you know, you, you, it, it, it's amazing how this stuff really, you can, you know, you, you have to have a little bit of an idea of, you know, uh, what's, I, I, to be honest, I, I didn't even know what, uh, you know, what, what, what one of these 10 gig ethernet cables, I'd never touched one in my life, right? When I had to patch these into the racks. I mean, that's the beauty of startups. You get to do a bit of everything. And you just, you know, you just learn all the time. Um, but, you know, in terms of, there's going to be rough edges, right? So, for example, one of the things we found out with Neutron is we wanted to use the Neutron metering agent to, uh, you know, build for bandwidth as providers do. Um, and we found out that it was, well, I, I certainly couldn't find a way to get it to filter out certain um, IP ranges. Uh, so, for example, if the customer was going internally to the object storage network, uh, I didn't want, obviously, to charge them for external bandwidth, that kind of stuff. So, uh, um, you, you ask around a little bit, you, you get a little bit of help. I, I think this is one area where, where perhaps things can always be improved. I mean, the Ask OpenStack thing is, is not particularly vibrant, I find, compared to, to other Ask communities out there. Um, and, you know, you figure out a workaround, you document it, and hopefully, going to your point, you know, what we hope to be doing somewhere down the line, really, and, and particularly with my background as a, as a developer, uh, is to start contributing back to the community so, uh, so you know, we, we, we get to pay back a little bit all of this amazing tech that we get for pretty much free. 
That's great, and sort of you know, kind of building on the concept of contributing. Um, so Wang, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the um, feedback that you're getting from some of your customers in terms of asks and how you're contributing into the, uh, the, the Neutron project. Okay, and uh, we know Neutron is uh, awesome uh, since they have a uh, very good community, they have active developers, they have uh, industry support, and uh, uh, the Neutron is poorly uh, software defined, no vendor locking. These are all features that our, uh, what our company or our customer like. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, Neutron has some uh, disadvantage as to its design, uh, like um, its lack of the uh, physical manage. Uh, uh, from the previous uh, previous release, Neutron has a new uh, feature na named uh, Hirachi Port Binding. It's about the TOR's, uh, TOR's uh, information binding, but it's not enough. And we what we need is manage the physical and the virtual networking both and it will keep the networking clean and uh, more uh, and more efficiency. But now Neutron takes the virtual uh, virtual role, but the physical is just uh, we assume that the physical is always work well. But the real world is that the physical network is not always well, and uh, we need some people like uh, infrastructure team or a networking team to operate uh, the switches. Uh, cables and the uh, port our NICs, and it's very, uh, it's very uh, not as, uh, you know, not as the except, except as uh, our uh, customers. And this, I think, is, I think the Neutron's uh, uh, the biggest pay point for the current. Great, and Dimitar, in terms of um, some of the thoughts that we were talking about the other day um, around you sort of overlays and underlays and building on Wang's point about the physical network. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about some of the discoveries that you found along your journey. Yeah, that is, um, uh, that is definitely an, an, an interesting topic. And, um, you know, that uh, overlay versus underlay uh, discussion has been kind of going on for a while. And, um, you know, uh, people even arguing, you know, which one's better, you know, overlay, underlay. Um, and um, the answer from my perspective is that they both have their, um, you know, they use and their place and they're, they're good for some things and they may be, um, you know, not, use, uh, not, not good for some other use cases, right? So um, what I find out from, um, uh, you, you know, um, um, Big Switch is, uh, you know, has one of the uh, kind of one of the few solutions on the marketplace which actually virtualizes the the underlay. And um, you know, there's two um, there's two aspects of that, right? Uh, first of all, uh, you know, you obviously have a uh, you know a software defined um, network right into the um, uh, you know into the actual fabric, uh, which uh, you know at that level um, kind of eliminates the need to have uh, to have an overlay at that level. At the same time, if you um, you know, if you have a number of uh, a number of pods with uh, you know a um, with a virtualized uh, underlay where you can have, and this is where the um, you know kind of making the connection with uh, with Neutron is you know you have Neutron um, basically directly uh, you know talking to your you know SDN controller uh, that it manages your uh, you know your fabric, uh, and at the same time if you wanna if if you, if you wanna interconnect. Uh, uh, you know, a number of pods that are, um, y y you know, in the same location, in different locations, that that's when you use, a, uh, you know, one of the, um, uh, one of the overlays. Uh, but the, the other aspect of it is that the, um, I, I, I talked previously about manageability, is that, um, you know, when you, when you have a, um, you know, a relatively um, kind of large size, uh, even not as large, even if, you, you know, something like as a, uh, you know, a, a, a four-rack, um, you know, pod, you still have about, you know, in a, uh, uh, spine and leaf architecture still have about 10 switches, right? Not about, but exactly 10 switches uh, with, um, uh, you know, two, um, uh, two spine and four, four leaf. Uh, so um, you have two options. You either, um, you, you know, uh, build that fabric, either layer two or layer, uh, layer three, um, you know, manually, and you manage it in one switch at a time, uh, or, um, you, you know, you have, a, you have a solution that, that manages that for you. And, um, you know, this is what I kind of see as a, as a, as a big advantage of, um, 
uh, you know, of the, the solution that Big Switch has uh, is that uh, it really re reduces the complexity of manage the managing that fabric to the, you know, complexity of, um, you know, pretty much the complexity of managing a single switch. Um, and to me, that's a big, uh, big advantage because now I can have, a, uh, you, you know, somebody like myself, I don't consider myself, a, a, you know, a network admin. Uh, I'm more of a generalist. Um, and so I, it, is, it could be a challenge for me to, um, not so much to build, I can probably build it, but to kind of to manage and maintain a, a, you know, a relatively large uh, a fabric. Uh, but I know that I can manage a single switch, uh, and so if we can manage a single switch, uh, I can pretty much, uh, you, you know, with, with, with some help for, you know, solution that, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of takes that away from me and reduces that complexity to manage a single switch, I know that I can do that and that, Kind of helps with uh, the adoption of the um, of the of the technology because now I can have a uh, you know a, a relatively smaller team that that manages the entire solution as opposed to uh, kind of the siloed um, you, you know solutions that we uh, or organizations that we uh, we uh, kind of we have in the legacy environment. So, great, Christian. I think if if I can add a little bit to this from me, I mean we've got really very different perspectives, I suppose. Um, me being a startup, you looking after, you know, a, a, a major sort of telco uh, operation. Um, but at the same time, it's funny to see that we've got, you know, very much the same kind of concerns, which I suppose are the kind of concerns that a lot of us are going to have. And in our case, you know, being a startup, well, what matters a lot to startups is, is um, CapEx and OpEx, right? And being able to uh, well, first of all, you're going to have to have <laughs> Neutron is all well and good, it, but it's at the end of the day still software, and somewhere you're going to have to have some hardware to run the network on. Um, and being able to do it all through a single pane of glass and thereby reducing complexity uh, really significantly. I mean, from, from a startup's perspective, where you've got about 10,000 things to do at every single point in time, I mean, that is fantastic, I have to say. It's, uh, it, and, and, and also, the ability to see that this is a solution that will accommodate future growth, again, from a startup's perspective, being able to start reasonably small, but know that you're not locking yourself into a, a, an infrastructure that you're going to have to throw away and, and rip out completely, you know, because, because you'll outgrow it uh, over time. I mean, I think that's, that also is very compelling. And, and uh, if I can just uh, add one thing, and the, the uh, you know, the other thing is I'm, I'm not sure if it's... Uh uh, I mean, it's clear to me. It's probably most most of you know, but uh, you know, Big Switch um, is is basically software, right? It's not a it's not an actual you know switch. Um, so it, it does support uh, you know a variety of um, uh, you know bare metal switches. So they, you have a lot of um, uh, you have a lot of choice from that point of view, kind of selecting your uh, selecting your own uh, your own hardware and. Um, you know, to, to Christian's point, um, you know, that, that helps reduce, um, you know, the CapEx significantly in terms of, uh, you know, the, the bare metal switches are significantly less expensive than, uh, you know, the branded equipment that we are mostly familiar with. Yeah, that's great. And so, Dallas, you know, in terms of going, uh, talking about uh, Neutron and, and your existing environment, maybe you could talk a little bit about where are you taking uh, this, this environment? What's your kind of growth um, plan? Sure. So our initial work was done sort of in a pilot mode with uh, you know, several classes that had you know, specialized software. Um, what we're looking at going next is taking this into our HPC environment. So we've got you know, 3,000, 4,000 nodes of uh, uh, compute uh, infrastructure that we'd like to be able to utilize for, for our, our VDI use case. Uh, again, when we have these kind of spiky workloads, it's nice to be able to throw it in a pool that can absorb it. And a lot of the, the, the research workloads can be preempted. And, and so the idea being uh, that we would deploy you know, OpenStack in, into the HPC environment and uh, uh, then, you know, again, using the same technologies we've been talking about, uh, be able to scale the workload into there. That's great. And in terms of uh, some of the feedback that you're getting from uh, conversations from customers, where do you think um, you know, the trends for adoption around uh, OpenStack and, and Neutron in China is looking like? Uh, as I mentioned before, the Neutron is trying to make uh, more and more open and uh, become a framework or a platform so customers can get more and more choice. Uh, since the community has mixed the default in reference implementation, 
may change from the OAS to Linux bridge. This means that uh, what you can try is more and, uh, is is more than the Linux bridge or open with switch. You can choose like uh, big switch. You can choose like uh, OVN or an another software based SDN solution. And even you can choose some. Um, uh, switch or hardware based SDN solution like from Cisco, like from Juniper. Uh, and uh, what customers need is uh, uh, stable and uh, performance and uh, scalability and uh, such, as, such as this. They, pr uh, they, they may pray for software or hardware, but the, uh, the final result is that the, what I mentioned is the three words uh, the scalability, performance, and the reliability. That's great. And, and so, uh, Dimitar, going back to uh, talking about futures and sort of where your project is going, we have heard a fair amount about the uh, Verizon Red Hat you know, Big Switch use case and NFV. Is, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about scalability and what you guys are building out. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, kind of what, what we're looking at is a, a, you know, a typical, you know, cloud, uh, cloud type environment with, uh, um, you know, a couple of, uh, uh, geographically distributed uh, data center regions and a number of uh, availability zones in each of the regions. Um, we are, um, you know, in, in, in our case, the availability zones kind of uh, equal to a pod. Um, you know, a pod would have a, um, you know, a pod interconnect uh, and uh, a number of, you know, compute and storage resources connected to the interconnect. Um, and that would be um, kind of uh, one um, uh, the building block of the of the of the cloud, if you will, um, that will be uh, in, in uh, kind of sub subscribing to this uh, to the you know core and port architecture, uh, where uh, you know you minimize the uh, the size of your full domain to the size of the the size of the pod, um, and this is directly driven by um, you know some of the some of the requirements that we have uh, in terms of the um, you know the availability and the resiliency of the solutions that we uh, we have to provide. Um, so um, uh, that's uh, you know that's pretty much uh, pretty much it from from that perspective. Great. Why don't we do kind of a, a quick sort of lightning round on uh, you know if you could do it all over again, what lessons learned? What, what would you do different, Christian? And then we'll kind of go through the the panelists and then open it up for Q and A. Well, I mean, we, we, we're still very. It's still very early days for us, but uh, I think one of the things that I've certainly learned, and I've got lots of input from from the summit here, is um, upgradability. Obviously, is a major concern. How you initially deploy your cloud is going to constrain this very much. Uh, Neutron being one of the more complex pieces to upgrade, uh, particularly without downtime. Um, and I think you know we would take a different approach to deploying the cloud. We would do something a little bit less monolithic perhaps based on Ansible, uh, OpenStack Ansible, for example, um, that, that would definitely be something that we would, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, well, we're going to have to sort this out somehow. Um, so I guess I, I won't speak to the VDI use case, but for our general sort of OpenStack hosting environment, I think um, one of the big things I would have done first is uh, inventory the pets. And, uh, you know, I think we've got a lot of applications that aren't really designed to work well in an OpenStack environment today that uh, we're sort of going through and looking at now. Um, and so, you know, we've had sort of a, an ongoing, uh, we have sort of our, our pods are in hybrid mode right now where it's, uh, you know, a lot of VMware and a little bit of OpenStack. So, um, you know, really it's going through and doing that inventory up front and, and starting to re-architect a lot of those things to work in a more fault tolerant way. So. Uh, from from my perspective, one one of the things that uh, you know I, I would change and would be would be you know difficult to change would be the uh, kind of the the governance process that we have to go through uh, you know in our um, own organization um, there uh, uh, in uh, another thing that is more kind of within uh, within my control is to. Um, uh, to spend, we, we spent quite a bit of uh, effort, but I would have spent more uh, in terms of, uh, you know, bringing, um, you know, other teams um, uh, in specifically in operations um, uh, earlier and kind of educate them and uh, and make them uh, kind of more enthusiastic about 
uh, you know, these, uh, these, these paradigm change. So it's, it's, it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, cultural change uh, and getting everybody involved, uh, you know, early in the process is, is critical. So uh, that's one thing for sure that I would have uh, approached differently. That's great. Wang, any uh, parting comments on things that you uh, have seen some of your clients that, that you wish that they had done differently or you know, what was the top sort of takeaway for issues to, uh, to avoid? Uh, uh, there is a there is a thing that uh, need to say that uh, uh, many people uh, says that SDN will will be a revolution. It will uh, kill all network engineers. But the reality is that now we use the SDN technology in uh, in OpenStack. Mostly the software based uh, is still need uh, the hardware operation, and uh, it will not. Uh, uh, make any re uh, result to the uh, network, uh, the traditional network uh, operation. So, uh, if uh, if the um, SDN solution should be more uh, productive, should could uh, in fact the virtual and uh, physical both way, and then the uh, the result and the operation or DevOps of the OpenStack and networking will be. Uh, Big change, yeah. Fantastic. So um, we're going to open it up now to Q and A. Uh, we have a you know, nice geographic representation, a variety of different operators and contributors, uh, and I see that we have a, a question. So go ahead. Um, yeah, my question has to do with the throughput of Open vSwitch. There are many technologies for bypassing the vSwitch, like DPDK or SRIOV or PCI pass through. Do any of your applications need more throughput than Open vSwitch, and are you going to these bypass technologies? Yeah. Uh, I can probably uh, address that uh, uh, quickly. So um, with the big switch it, it, it's solution, it's actually not using uh, Open vSwitch. Uh, they, they, uh, there is a, um, uh, it's specifically called, I, I believe it's a switch light uh, virtual uh, is the, uh, is the uh, virtual switch that is basically replacing open this switch it's still using by the way the uh, the kernel uh, uh, the kernel uh, kind of portion of open this switch so it doesn't require uh, you know additional changes to the kernel uh, but at the same time uh, it does replace the user space which you know which is where the bottleneck is in the first place um, so it doesn't by definition use the open this switch did and I get this right? It, yeah, that's right. And, okay, and, yeah. and then, but in time, <laughs> but I was going to ask in terms of um, building on his question, the the types of applications that you have in your environment that uh, that require that type of throughput. Oh, uh, the, the the types of uh, applications um, uh, there, um, you know, in a um, in a, a private cloud environment, uh, there'll be uh, you know the full variety of uh, you know enterprise class applications that you can imagine, and you know some of some of them are more demanding for uh, networking than others. But uh, uh, you know we we know that there are you know multiple that are really demanding to you know for uh, uh, networking uh, performance. So um. I, I think my, uh, no, to translate the question. Is 10 gig into the VM enough? If it's not enough, you may need to go to the bypass technologies. Is, do you need to have more than 10 gig coming into the VM? Um, if we need to have more than 10 gig into the uh, into the VM, uh, realistically, um, you know, I have to be if. if uh, you cannot get, um, you know, 10 gig uh, to the VM um, unless you go to something like uh, SROV or you go yeah, to DPDK, I mean. right? That's what it really. Uh, so exactly. So um, you, you know, and you absolutely need that if you, uh, you know, if that's what you want to do. Uh, and um, you know, I've been talking to Big Switch quite extensively on that and. Um, um, uh, my understanding is that the, the next release of uh, Big Switch will be uh, integrating DPDK, which will you know take. So so it's extremely important. Uh, if you there was a 
There was a presentation uh, um, with um, uh, Verizon just before this one. Uh, they actually talked about this because the, in, in their case, they're deploying it for, uh, you know, for NAV, which is actual, um, you know, networking workloads. Uh, and for that, uh, it is, you know, it, it is absolutely necessary. Um, I, I'll have to, you know, uh, kind of defer to somebody from, uh, from Big Switch as to, you know, when the DP, DPDK integration is going to be complete. My understanding is with the next release, but uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I see Ken nodding, so uh, he confirms that. That's correct. All right. Great. Any other comments on the panel on, on that question? All right. Great. Next question. Hi. I'd like to hear from each of you on this one. Um, in the real world, what do you do when things go wrong? And how are you monitoring, like, both the underlay and the overlay? Are you using, what tools do you go to, TCP dump? Using ganglia? What, what's your uh, sense of the state of the art and how, it, how would you improve it? Um, and thank you. I, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of different approaches, I guess, to this. I mean, we, we use um, traditional stuff such as um, Zabbix for monitoring and the ELK stack uh, to collate logs, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that Big Switch internally also provides some great um, analytics and visibility tools. And again, that goes back to the single pane of glass uh, whereby, you know, being a, having a, a physical plus virtual layer that actually addresses the entire spectrum um, gives you great visibility uh, across, you know, across the boundaries. Essentially, the boundaries just 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 mesh into one, which is, uh, you know, again going back to the simplicity argument. It's it's fantastic, and it's it's kind of next gen stuff, really. And uh, it's it's one of these things. Once you've experienced it, you you kind of wonder how you did without. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, a variety of things and strategies will 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 work. I think well. I haven't found anything that works well yet. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you know, we, 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 I mean, it's this hodgepodge of stuff, right? And uh, uh, you know, if someone has the answer, please stand up. I would love to hear it. But um, other than you know, going out and, and spending millions for certain vendors who will remain nameless, um, tools that say they'll do the job but really won't. Um, I, you know, in the absence of that, we're um, looking at you know, basically pulling that data as much together as we can. We're using Splunk for uh, you know, to basically suck in a lot of the logging data and then writing things on top of that to, um, you know, to, look, for look, to look for the patterns. And um, when we initially deployed our pods, we've had all sorts of you know, fun stuff that you find, right? And, and it's, it's a, how, do you, how do you figure that out and what it, what it is and iron it out. And um, so that, that, that's been tremendously useful for us. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll go back to the, um, the overlay versus the underlay um, uh, topic that we, uh, we talked about. Um, it is the, so um, in, in this, typically in the, um, you know, overlay, underlay situation, if you're using overlay, uh, what happens is, you, in essence, you have two separate networks, right? So you have, uh, you have a physical network that, uh, you know, you might be managing or somebody else is managing uh, very likely. Uh, and then, and then you have your overlay on top of that. So basically, you have a virtual network and you know, physical network. And, and in many cases, they, um, they, uh, you, the, the overlay doesn't have the uh, uh, doesn't have any visibility into the underlay, other than say it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. And, and then, and then you start troubleshooting. Um, in, in this case, um, and you know, Christian as well touched on that. Uh, in the case of uh, a big switch, you 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 have a you know one solution. So basically, um, uh, the, the the virtual switch that we talked about um, that uh, is in the um, is running um, basically on the hypervisor is in fact part of the fabric. Right? It's it's like a it's like a fabric switch. So it's a you know in a in a P plus V. Uh, uh, fabric, as, as they call it, uh, basically it becomes a from a, a you know from a two-layer uh, spinal leaf, it becomes a three-layer spinal leaf. But the, the virtual switch is really um, you know part of the fabric, and you have the visibility of the entire fabric, both physical and virtual, because it's one fabric from a single SDN um, a, you know single SDN controller. Uh, so you get the entire visibility into the entire you know solution, both physical and virtual, from from one place. Uh, and, and there are certain tools that they, um, you know, they provide. Like, uh, you know, you can you can 
um, uh, you know, test path, I believe is exactly what it's called, uh, where you can, uh, you know, um, uh, generate traffic from one point and, and just see it how it goes from, uh, you know, to, uh, to another point, both through the, uh, you know, virtual and, and, and physical, physical environment and see exactly where it stops if, if, it, if it does, if you, you know, if you're troubleshooting some problem. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I can, can add to that question. Or, yeah, Wang, any final comments on that? Okay, I can add some comment to that. Uh, uh, in my opinion, there, so far there is no uh, perfect tool for uh, overlay networking visual visualization. You might, you may be need to combine, as you say, TCP dump or IP route or NetLink or something tools that you familiar with. And uh, uh, yes, it is pretty complex. There is no uh, perfect tools to uh, monitoring the under overlay networking. Great, I think we have time for one, we're a little bit over, but time for one last question. Yeah, there was some mention of migrating existing virtual network and VMware uh, to OpenStack. Just wondering, you know, what are the steps you go through? Do you have to, once again, create network subnets, interfaces, things like that, or is there a way to just move the metadata, have it point to the existing network, take over the management? under OpenStack, how do you go about doing the migration? I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, right now it's, it's not a, I haven't found a simple way to do it. I mean, I, it, as I said, a lot of it, it gets back to, you know, how do we sort of untangle, um, as I, my CTO says, the, the, the spaghetti monster that is a lot of these applications and, and, and really look at, you know, how do we really build them for fault tolerance and resiliency? And um, in doing that, I think it, it, it means straightening out some of the networking stuff that's there now. We've got a lot of big, big flat subnets that are, um, you know, that, 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 are, that are there and, and <laughs> trying to you know segment that out um, and uh, you know so what we've done from our e even VMware to VMware um, from sort of our legacy hosting environment into the into the pods is uh, we, we do a temporary span to get things over and then start doing the re-architecture in the new environment so um, and the idea being the span goes away and you actually start managing those networks through um, you know, in this in our case that big switch so Great, fantastic. Well, we're at the end of the time. Thank you all for staying. I wanted to thank the panelists uh, for their insight and sharing sort of the lessons learned along the, the journey of neutron networking. And uh, we're, we're going to wrap. Thank you so much.